بسم الله بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ووله أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته. How's everybody doing? الحمد لله fantastic. So today الحمد لله we begin سورة الأعلى سورة 87 of the مصحف. And this uh, surah has multiple names. Surah Al-A'la is the most popular. It can also be called Surah Sabih and also Surah Sabih Isma Rabbika Al-A'la. Um, this, uh, this surah uh, is a Mecki surah. And in fact, uh, the order of revelation uh, in terms of the list given by Jabir Ibn Zayd, uh, anhu, he says it's number eight, which me makes it a very early surah. Actually, it's a very early. So you can imagine the Muslims just receiving revelation, only having a few surahs, early theology. And this comes quite early on. Uh, I would say a major theme uh, in this surah is the contrast between permanence versus transience, as in things that last and things that don't last. Um, so, for instance, you find that ayat 1 to 4, they talk about how we were made, and we're obviously made for this temporary life, and then ayat number, four, uh, number, ayat number 5 is about how this world, how we end in this world, and then ayat number 6 is what we learn from this world, ayat number 7 is what we forget, except what is permanent, referring to Qur'an. You know, some of it we, we are going to forget, but others is going to remain with us and remain permanent. And then Allah Ta'ala throughout ayat 8 to 15 talks about how this Qur'an will always benefit the good and not the evil. Then Allah Ta'ala in ayah number 16 talks about how this world is transient and ayah number 17 how the afterlife is permanent and then ayat 18 and 19 how this message has never changed, this message is permanent. So I mention this all just to say that you could look at it from a thematic perspective, everything has in one way or another to do with permanence versus transientness, transientness or, or, or things that are fleeting. And in terms of a thematic breakdown you can also take a look at it from a ring structure perspective. Uh, if you look at ayat 1 to 5, you find that Allah Ta'ala is teaching us that we need to glorify who? The creator, the fashioner, the determiner, the guider, the one who starts and the one who ends life. And so Allah Ta'ala is teaching us that this is what you need to know. This is what you need to make tasbih, you need sabbih. You have to glorify this Lord who, you know, uh, created you, fashioned you, put you into this world, started your life and will end it. And then ayat, if you look at the last section, uh, that would be the seventh section, if you break it down to seven in the ring structure. Uh, ayat 18 to 19 talk about how this message has always been around forever, glorifying the creator and the fashioner and the terminator. This, this message is a permanent message. So that's how one, you could say the two layers. Then if you go closer than that, section two and section six, you find that section two, which is ayat uh, six to eight, they talk about how the Qur'an, some of it you're gonna lose, it's short term, and other portions of it you will keep, and that's long term. And then uh, 16 to 17 is talking about how this life versus the next life, short term versus long term. So you see a correlation between those two. Then you have even more clear ayat, uh, 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 the third section you could say, ayat 9 to 10 talk about how you have to give reminders to the righteous. And ayat 14 to 15 is talking about how the righteous will prosper because of those reminders. And then the, se the, the, the center, the center portion is uh, talking about what? How the wicked won't benefit. That seems to be the center concept that look, doesn't matter how much reminders you give, the wicked won't benefit. And those are ayat 11 to 13. So when you break it down into seven sections thematically, you find that the first and the seventh, the second, the sixth, the third and the fourth, and then they, they all correlate with one another. And then the middle one has, stands out on its own as something unique saying, look, the disbelievers won't be benefited by this glorious and incredible reminder. It doesn't matter how much you try, subhanAllah. There are only two, two commands uh, in this surah. Sabih, obviously the first ayah, uh, talking about glorifying Allah Ta'ala, and uh, dhakir, uh, uh, dhakir, remind. So we'll get to those when we get there, inshallah Ta'ala. Uh, with the previous surah, it's very interesting, the correlations. The previous surah, this is surah 87. The surah right before it is 86. Surah 86 is what? Surah Tariq, right? Surah Tariq. Um, so Surah Tariq, it talks about what? فَمَهِّلْ الْكَافِرِينَ أَمْهِمْهُ الْرُوَيْدَى uh, um, um, oh my um, him, uh, um, hum, or Excuse me, I don't know why I'm tripping up everywhere. So this ayah is quite interesting because it's talking about what? Let the disbelievers, let them, let them go. Let them, uh, you know, uh, be as bad as they want to be. And then now that you have turned your attention away from the disbelievers, give them as much time as they want. Why? Be, now what should you do? Turn your attention towards Allah. Asabih. Now you can glorify Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So subhanAllah, you can see the correlation. But another interesting correlation is that the Surah Al-Tariq talks about the highest thing that we could visibly see, which is what? Wasana'i wa tariq this piercing star so far in the sky. But then the next surah is saying what? Sabih ismi rabbika al-a'la, that even no matter how high you go, guess what? Something is higher. 
So you see a correlation between the two as well. It's quite beautiful the way they are connected. There's other ways as well. But yeah, th this surah has 19 ayat. Surah Al-A'la has 19 ayat, just like Surah Al-Alaq and also Surah Infitar. So there's only uh, three surahs that have 19 ayat. So that's the introduction. Let's get into the uh, surah itself. Allah Ta'ala begins. So the first thing that we should note is that this is from the Surah Al-Musabbihat. Now, how many Surah Al-Musabbihat are there? How many surahs begin with some type of tasbih of Allah? Anybody have an idea? Huh? Five? Close? Seven. That's right, seven. Seven. Uh, so what are they? Surah Al-Isra, Surah Hadid, Surah Hashr, Surah Saf, Surah Jum'ah, Surah Taghabin, and Surah A'la. Seven surahs begin with the tasbih of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now what's amazing is look at their order. Look at how, it's just, it's amazing. This is, little things like this really make you say, this, is, this must be from Allah. I mean, how else, who else puts things together so incredibly? So Surah Al-Isra begins with the noun, the noun. Subhanalladhi. Right? Subhanallah the Asra. Right? So Allah Ta'ala begins with the noun. And a noun is a stated timeless fact. It's not, it's not given a past or a present or a future. It's just a timeless fact. So Allah begins with the Subhan, right? Like, like just, just as, a, as a noun. Then the next three are Surah Al Hadid, Surah Al Hashr, and Surah Saf. And those are all in the past tense. Subha lillahi ma fi samawati, etc. Sometimes wa ma fi al sometimes not. Uh, but still, you have three in the past tense. Then Surah Jum'ah and Surah Taghabun are Yusabbihu, Yusabbihu Lillahi in the present tense. And then the final one, Surah Al-A'la is in what? In the command form, Al-Amr. Sabbih isma rabbika. So, I mean, SubhanAllah, just little things like this. The fact that it goes from a noun and then three times in the past tense, twice in the present tense, and then finally in the command form. To me, I just feel like you could say it's a coincidence, but it's not a coincidence, you know what I mean? I don't know, it's too, it's too beautiful. It's too uh, artistic and, and, and just incredible to say that it just, hap it just happens then, subhanAllah. Yes, and so, uh, yes, everything is covered, whether you're talking about the past tense, the present tense, the future tense, or uh, a noun, which is a permanent or eternal method, or finally, a command. In every sort of form, Allah Ta'ala is beginning a surah in one way or another, emphasizing this fact. There is a hadith and the Nabiya Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Kana la yanamu hatta yaqra al-musabbihati wa yaqul fiha ayatun khayrun min alfi ayatin uh, So alfi ayatin That the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would not sleep until he had recited the musabbihat and he would say in them is an ayah that is better than a thousand ayat This is a hadith in Tirmidhi, it's also graded Hasan Ibn Kathir uh, hypothesized and said, I think that this special ayah that is, you know, worth more than a, a thousand ayat is uh, This is his theory, but it's just a theory. Now, um, also, uh, it's a very interesting that the Prophet said, is an authentic hadith in Ibn Majah. Um, uh, لما, this is actually Uqba ibn Amir, he said, uh, نزلت, uh, العظيم, that when the Prophet received the command, the, the ayah, العظيم, glorify the, the name of your Lord who is the most great, العظيم, he said, put this in your ruku'. And then when he got this ayah saying, Glorify your Lord the Most High, uh, put it in your sujood. Why? And Allah knows best, but the people hypothesize and they say the beauty of this is al-azim is something that is great but also stable. And that's why our, bo our bodies are stable because of our azim, our bones, right? Obviously, if we didn't have bones, we'd just be a mush of uh, you know, flesh, right? So the things that gives us stability is our bones. So al-azim means the great and also the stable. And we say this when we are the least stable, when we're in ruku'ah. And the position of ruku'ah is a position of instability. If a young kid is running by and bumps into you when you're in ruku'ah, you're gonna n get knocked over very easily, right? So you're in a position of instability saying, Glory, glory be to my Lord, who is the most stable. And then obviously, the, the other one is even more obvious. When you're in sajda, you're saying what? Subhana Rabbi al-A'la, glory be to my Lord, who is the most high, and your face is as low as it possibly gets. Unless, of course, you dig a hole and put your head in that, but I don't think most people do that. You are basically as low as it gets. Uh, you are pushing your face to the floor, and so therefore, subhanAllah, you are as low as you can be, glorifying the Lord, who is the most high. So there seems to be this incredible uh, contrast going on here, and we should really appreciate it. The big question, of course, is what is this word uh, tasbih even mean? Well, we know that sibaha uh, or uh, sabaha means to swim, right? And so the question is, what does swimming have to do with glorifying Allah Ta'ala? Well, there is actually a connection. When you are swimming, what are you doing? You are stopping yourself from sinking and drowning. That you're, you're basically, if you want to put it simply, you are keeping yourself up, right? That's what, that's what swimming is all about, you know, treading water and keeping yourself up. 
Now, when you're making tasbih of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you are keeping Allah ta'ala up in your own estimation. In other words, you are not allowing yourself to lower Allah ta'ala in your own thoughts or in your own mind. And so a good example of this would be, I know a simple example would be, you know, you get a flat tire and you're very frustrated. Why is God picking on me? Everybody else is driving by just fine. Why is God being unjust to me? And so on and so forth. So through this, or you get a sickness, or you get a divorce, or you lose a job, or what, et cetera. We all get the point, right? There's many different ways, or shirk, of course, is a big one that you're saying Allah has partners or associates, or, or Allah Ta'ala has, uh, you know, some sort of a help and needs help and so on and so forth, or needs intermediaries to go to him because, I don't know, he's not knowledgeable enough. He needs somebody to tell him things. A'udhu Billah. So what do we say? We say, Subhanallah uh, amma yushrikun. Allah Ta'ala is high above whatever they make shirk. Whatever evil thoughts may come to my mind, whether it be shirk related or whether it be dhulm related or whatever the case may be, whatever evil, whatever, this is all lowering Allah Ta'ala in your estimation. And saying, Subhanallah, you're doing what? You're elevating Allah Ta'ala and saying, Allah is high above any sort of evil thoughts I may uh, uh, erroneously attribute to Him. May Allah Ta'ala keep us safe from these things. And this obviously, I mean, this, this concept of tasbih is in our deen, after salah, you make tasbihat. Uh, uh, throughout the Quran, there's mentions, in fact, 18 times. Allah Ta'ala commands فَسَبِّحْ or سَبِّحُ throughout the Qur'an 18 times. So clearly this is a very big deal which shows what? That human beings are prone to having negative thoughts. Unfortunately, due to, our, due to our own weaknesses and ignorance, we will have negative thoughts about Allah. So we always have to be reminded to what? Know that whatever situation I'm in, this is good for me, this is purifying me. Allah Ta'ala has a wisdom behind this. I cannot lower Allah Ta'ala in my estimation. Now, <clears throat> usually tasbih comes with the verb, or with the harf ba, right? Uh, 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 so usually, there you find the ba, but here there is no ba. Sabbih uh, isma rabbik al-a'la, there is no bismi rabbik al-a'la. So, um, having the ba would theoretically mean what? Declare the perfection of, uh, of Allah with the name of your Lord the Most High. In other words, use Allah Ta'ala's name to glorify Him with the name. However, the fact that Allah Ta'ala omitted the ba implies what? That there's less focus on the dhikr itself and more on acknowledging the correct, correcting one, one's thoughts. So a translation could be, perfect the name or perfect the mention or the idea or the thought of your Lord the Most High. Always try to perfect Allah, not just the, uh, uh, yeah, so that's, that's one idea. I.e., meaning what? Ensure that your thoughts and attitudes about Allah Ta'ala have due reverence, awe, and respect at all times. It's a ta'zim, a tanzih, etc. These are different words for it. Magnification, purification, all this is implied in tasbih. Yes. So we obviously know that Allah Ta'ala, as Allah Ta'ala mentions, that there's nothing that is like Him. Now, all of our negative qualities, obviously we don't attribute to Allah. In terms of our positive qualities, yes, you could say that, well, I see and Allah sees. I hear and Allah hears. I am living and Allah is living. Al-Hayy, Al-Basir, Al-Samir, right? However, the difference is this, that Allah Ta'ala is not like us in what, in, for what reason? That all of His names and attributes, they are eternal. Us, we live, but then we die. We can see, but then we obviously we go blind when we die. And same thing with hearing, etc., etc. So Allah Ta'ala, it's eternal. There's no beginning and no end. Furthermore, it's unlimited. I can see what's in this room. I can't see what's in the next room. I can't see what's in the next city. So, so on and so forth. Same thing with hearing. It's all limited, etc. Whereas Allah Ta'ala, all of His attributes, unlimited. And also, they are inherent. In other words, Allah Ta'ala didn't get them from somebody else. All of my attributes, anything I have of seeing and hearing and living, it all came from Allah Ta'ala. Whereas for Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala, it's all um, something that he inherently has. So yes, so, uh, in sujood, we say what? Subhana Rabbi al-A'la, instead of saying Subhana Rabbi, uh, uh, Subhana Ismi Rabbi al-A'la. We don't put the ism there. So that's a question. Why is that the, the ism is not there? So from a practical perspective, the ism isn't seeming to make a difference. And some say it's in the function of a sila, like al ladhi like a ism mawsura, uh, ism mawsur. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam, but there are other interpretations, which I think is very nice. From an intellectual perspective, this is making us think about the perfection of Allah in all of His divine names and attributes. In other words, it's not just glorify Allah, but His name as in all of the Asma Allah. Every, uh, all of the names of Allah. Think about Allah Ta'ala in all of His glor glorified names and make tasbih of every single one of them. Uh, Subhanal Rahman, Subhanal Rahim, etc. etc. Like, Allah Ta'ala is glorified in every single one of His names and attributes, and Allah knows best. SubhanAllah. Then Allah Ta'ala specifies one name of, of, of His, which is Ar-Rabb, Rabbik, right? Sabih isma Rabbik al-A'la. Why specifically the name Rabb instead of any other? Because when a 
slave, when a human being truly understands who his master is, then tasbih becomes a lot easier. Glorification of Allah and recognizing his greatness becomes a lot easier when you finally recognize that you are a slave of Allah. The problem is usually what? Ego. When you see yourself as I am entitled, I deserve X, Y, and Z, that's when you start to diminish Allah Ta'ala in your, in your estimation. Why? Because you're thinking, well, I deserve this. Why should I get sick? Why well, deserve that, you know? So it's, it's arrogance and entitlement, that's what poisons it. The moment you realize that Allah is your Rabb and therefore you are the Abd, then tasbih becomes a lot, a lot easier, SubhanAllah. And Rabb obviously can mean multiple things. Uh, the ultimate authority, master, sustainer, and creator. Al-A'la. Al-A'la interestingly can be a sifa or a na'at, a, a quality de defining Rabbik, or it can also be the ism. So it could go back to either one. Obviously Rabbik would be the most standard, but ism, even though it's a bit more of a jump, it still is uh, uh, technically correct. And subhanAllah, it's quite beautiful the way uh, there's multiple, atawassu'a fil ma'na, there's, you know, there's room for multiple ways of looking at this. And Allah knows best. Al-A'la is mentioned nine times in the Quran. The big question we have to ask ourselves from this ayah, I'm only going to cover this ayah today, inshallah. There's a lot to talk about this ayah. So don't worry, I'll be done soon, inshallah. But the question that you have to ask yourself is, just as Allah Ta'ala is the most high when it comes to this creation, He is above the, the seven heavens, the question we have to ask ourselves is this, is He the most high, is He al-a'la in our own hearts? That's the real question. So when you make tasbih of Allah Ta'ala, when Allah Ta'ala commands you, sabbih isma rabbika al-a'la, the question is, the ism here, yani al-that, it could refer to the essence of Allah Ta'ala, His self or his mention, or his thought. And so the question is, what about in my own thoughts? What about in my own estimation? What do I put number one? What am I most concerned of? You know, a young man might be falling in love with a certain girl, and so that's the top thing on his mind. Or you might have exams coming up, and so that's the top thing on your mind. Or you might want to get this new job because money is the top thing on your mind. So al-a'la implies what? Not just in the, uh, you know, the, the reality of the universe, but in your own estimation. SubhanAllah, it's a very powerful concept. This verse also means that you have to have reverence. Make tasbih as in clean up and elevate the way you even talk about Allah Ta'ala. Not just in your heart, but also on your tongue. As Allah says, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ إِذَا ذُكِرَ اللَّهُ وَجِلَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ وَإِذَا تُلِيَتْ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتُهُ زَادَتْهُمْ إِيمَانًا وَعَلَى رَبِّهِمْ يَتَوَكَنُونَ The believers are those, are only those who, when Allah is mentioned, their hearts become fearful. And when His, his verses are recited to them, it increases them in faith. So, subhanAllah, you shouldn't be speaking about Allah in a disrespectful way. You have to be careful about the way you speak about Allah. And in fact, those who weren't careful were warned in Surah At-Tawbah, a very heavy surah, right? It doesn't start with the Bismillah. We know that Allah, uh, why is that? Because Allah is, it's not appropriate for a surah about like harshness and war to begin with Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, right? So it, ha it doesn't begin with the Bismillah, the Bismillah. And Allah Ta'ala says in it what? وَلَئِن سَأَلْتَهُمْ إِنَّمَا كُنَّا نَخُوذُ وَنَلْعَبْ قُلْ أَبِ اللَّهِ وَآيَاتِ وَرَسُولِهِ كُنْتُمْ تَسْتَهْزِئُونَ SubhanAllah. لَا تَعْتَذِرُوا قَدْ كَفَرْتُمْ بَعْدَ إِيمَانِكُمْ Very, very heavy ayat. When it comes to joking around and not having due reverence and due respect for Allah's, not, Allah's name and descriptions and so forth. The ayat, Allah said what? And if you ask them, they will surely say, this is about a certain incident with the time, at the time of Prophet ﷺ, people were joking around making jokes about Allah and His Messenger and the Deen and so on and so forth. And so Allah revealed these ayat. If you, and if you were to ask this group who were making jokes that were basically considered munafiqeen, hypocrites, if you were to ask them, they will surely say, we were only conversing and playing. We're just joking around. We're just making jokes about, you know, you know imagine, oh, the beard, haha, well, I think it looks like this. Or, I don't know, the thobe looks like that. Or, oh, this person, you know, he's always praying. He's looking like, you know, you're making jokes about prayer or whatever the case is, right? Making fun of something that has to do with the deen or the Prophet or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They were saying, oh, we're just, you know, we're just nahudu and nanab. We're just playing around. We're just goofing around. Qul, say in response, is it Allah and His verses and His messenger that you are mark mocking? Don't make any excuses. You have disbelieved. You have indeed disbelieved after you had iman, after you had belief. So this is a very clear-cut ayah that takfir is done, disbelief is done by al-istihza. When you mock and make fun of Allah, His Messenger, or the ayat, when you make fun of this deen, there you can't then say, no, no, it's just a joke. Well, it doesn't matter if you're joking or not. Joking about Allah's deen and mocking it, this is a uh, kufr according to this ayah. So don't take my word for it. Allah says it very plainly. Furthermore, we should remember that Allah is encouraging us to what? Use the names of Allah that He uses for Himself. As Allah says, وَلِلَّهِ الْأَسْمَاءُ الْحُسْنَى فَدْعُوهُ بِهَا وَذَرُوا الَّذِينَ يُلْحِدُونَ فِي أَسْمَائِهِ That, and to Allah belong the best names, so invoke Him by them. 
call to Allah by the names that he used himself in the Quran and Sunnah and leave the company of those who practice deviation concerning his names. When it comes to Allah's names and attributes, those who go into deviation, leave that stuff alone. Furthermore, we should be so careful about how we talk about Allah Ta'ala that we're not even supposed to insult other people's deities out of fear that maybe they are going to insult Allah Ta'ala as Allah says in Surah Al-An'am وَلَا تَسُبُّوا الَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ فَيَسُبُّوا اللَّهَ عَدْوًا بِغَيْرِ عِلْمٍ that, and do not insult those they invoke other than Allah, lest they insult Allah in enmity without knowledge. So SubhanAllah, just out of the possibility, the believer is supposed to be smart and think not just action, but action reaction. You're always supposed to think two, three, four steps ahead. And so part of this is what? Out of respect for Allah Ta'ala, I will not say your deities at X, Y, Z, all these insults, because obviously the person's going to insult you back. And the same thing with, uh, uh, you know, insulting people's families, you know, insulting your own mother. How do I insult my own mother? Well, you talk about his mother, he's going to talk about your mother, etc. So don't, don't cross lines and inshallah ta'ala you avoid these problems. Think a few steps ahead. Imam Malik, at his time, people, when, they, when a beggar was asking for some wealth and they would have, not want to give it to him, what would they say? They'd say, Allah will help you, Allah will help you. This was a common thing at his time, and he, but Imam Malik wouldn't say that, and he didn't want to mention Allah in a state when the person was mad. So he was always trying to elevate the name of Allah, even in the person's mind, and not saying anything negative. And the last point that I want to, actually no, two final points I want to close with. One is a quote from Shaykh Ibn Uthaymeen, Rahimahullah says something very beautiful. He says, إِنَّ التَّسْبِيحَةَ الْوَاحِدَةَ فِي صَحِيفَةِ الْإِنسَانِ خَيْرٌ مِنَ الدُّنْيَا وَمَا فِيهَا لِأَنَّ الدُّنْيَا وَمَا فِيهَا تَذْهَبُ وَتَزُول وَالتَّسْبِيحُ وَالْعَمَلُ الصَّالِحُ يَبْقَى That a single tasbih, he says a single time of saying SubhanAllah, one single time you say SubhanAllah, in a person's scroll of deeds is better than everything in this world, uh, in, uh, better than this dunya and everything in it. Because the dunya and everything in it will eventually disappear. Everything's going to go away. But that one single tasbih that you made, it's going to be, it's going to remain forever. Inshallah, it's going to be for you uh, a tree in paradise or whatever. Uh, as, as, I think, oh, was it? No, la hawla wa la qatala billah is a uh, treasure in paradise, if I'm not mistaken, from the hadith. And I think a tasbih is a tree in paradise. I'm, this is, I'm, I'm not fully remembering. But anyway, you get my point that it's going to be a reward for you in paradise that is going to be permanent, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, the final point that I want to mention is that, yes, the command to make tasbih is mentioned 18 times in the Qur'an. There are many different commands of sabbih or sabbihu. But what's interesting is that five surahs finish with the command. And which surahs are these? Surah Al-Hijr, Surah Al-Tur, uh, Surah Waqi'ah, Surah Haqa, and Surah Nasr. Right? These five surahs end with an ayah that says, in conclusion, make tasbih. So it's just really beautiful that Allah Ta'ala concludes in these different places with the command to make tasbih. And also, very interestingly, there are three surahs that five verses away from the last verse have a tasbih, uh, the command to make tasbih. Specifically, five verses away from the last one. There's a three different surahs. Isn't that, I don't know why, you really, this is one of those things that, you know, somebody who has to, is doing their PhD has to, you know, study these things and figure out why. Why specifically five? Ayat, and these are Surah Taha, Surah Qaf, and Surah Insan. That in these uh, three surahs, you find that Allah makes the command to do the tasbih, and then uh, with, within five ayat of the final, uh, of the ending of the surah. Something just interesting when you pay attention to these, word, um, uh, these words in the Quran, you always find these interesting patterns that make you very curious, and Allah knows best about their details. Uh, and so with that, inshallah ta'ala, we close and we open up for comments. Jamdul khairan, wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh.